Mr. Alderman, would it be convenient to you to go on until five o'clock? Very well. When the tribunal rose yesterday afternoon, I had just completed an outline of the plans laid by the Nazi conspirators <clears throat> in the weeks immediately following the Munich Agreement. These plans called for what the German officials called the liquidation of the remainder of Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> you will recall that three weeks after Munich, on 21 October, the same day on which the administration of the Sudetenland was handed over to the civilian authorities, Hitler and Keitel had issued an order to the armed forces. This order is document C-136, exhibit USA number 104. <clears throat> In this order, Hitler and Keitel ordered the beginning of preparations by the armed forces for the conquest of the remainder of Czechoslovakia. You will also recall that two months later, on 17 December, the defendant Keitel issued an appendix to the original order directing the continuation of these preparations. This document is number C-138, exhibit USA 105, and both these documents have already been introduced. Proceeding on the assumption <clears throat> that no resistance worth mentioning was to be expected. This order emphasized that the attack on Czechoslovakia was to be well camouflaged so that it would not appear to be a warlike action. To the outside world, it said, and I quote, it must appear obvious that it is merely an action of pacification and not a warlike undertaking, ending the quote. Thus, in the beginning of 1939, the basic planning for military action against the mutilated Czechoslovak Republic had already been carried out by the German High Command. I turn now to the underhand and criminal methods used by the Nazi conspirators to ensure that no resistance worth mentioning would, in fact, be met by the German army. As in the case of Austria and the Sudetenland, the Nazi conspirators did not intend to rely on the Wehrmacht alone to accomplish their calculated objective of liquidating Czechoslovakia. With the German minority separated from Czechoslovakia, they could no longer use the cry, home to the Reich. One sizable minority, the Slovaks, still remained within the Czechoslovak state. I should mention at this point that the Czechoslovak government had made every effort to conciliate Slovak extremists in the months after the session of the Sudetenland. Autonomy had been granted to Slovakia with an autonomous cabinet and parliament at Bratislava. Nonetheless, despite these concessions, it was in Slovakia that the Nazi conspirators found fertile ground for their tactics. The picture which I shall now draw of Nazi operations in Slovakia is based on the Czechoslovak official government report, number 988 PS, already admitted in evidence as Exhibit USA 91, and of which the court has already taken judicial notice. Nazi propaganda and research groups 
had long been interested in maintaining close connections with the Slovak autonomous opposition, autonomous opposition. When Bela Tuka, who later became prime minister of the puppet state of Slovakia, was tried for espionage and treason in 1929, the evidence established that he had already established connections with Nazi groups within Germany. Prior to 1938, Nazi aides were in close contact with the Slovak traitors living in exile and were attempting to establish more profitable contacts in the semi-fascist Slovak Catholic People's Party of Monsignor Andrew Hilinka. In February and July 1938, the leaders of the Henlein movement conferred with top men of Father Helenka's party and agreed to furnish one another with mutual assistance in pressing their respective claims to autonomy. This understanding proved useful in the September agitation when at the proper moment the Foreign Office in Berlin wired Henlein leader Kunt in Prague to tell the Slovaks to start their demands for autonomy. This telegram, our document 2858PS, Exhibit USA 97, has already been introduced in evidence and read. By this time, mid-summer 1938, the Nazis were in direct contact with figures in the Slovak autonomous, autonomous movement and had paid agents among the higher staffs of Father Hlinka's party. These agents undertook to render impossible any understanding between the Slovak autonomists and the Slovak parties in the government at Prague. Franz Karmarsen, later to become Volksgruppenführer, had been appointed Nazi leader in Slovakia and professed to be serving the cause of Slovak autonomy while actually on the Nazi payroll. On 22 November, the Nazis indiscreetly wired Karmarsen to collect his money at the German legation in person. I now offer in evidence document 2859 PS as exhibit USA 107, captured from the German Foreign Office files. I read this telegram, which was sent from the German legation at Prague to Pressburg. Delegate Kunt asks to notify State Secretary Karmarsen he would appreciate it if he could personally draw the sum which is being kept for him at the Treasury of the Embassy. Signed, Henker. Karmarsen proved to be extremely useful to the Nazi cause. Although out of chronological place in my discussion, I should like now to offer in evidence Document 2794 PS, a captured memorandum of the German Foreign Office, which I offer as Exhibit USA 108, dated Berlin, 29 November 1939. This document, dated eight months after the conquest of Czechoslovakia throws a revealing light both on Karmazin and on the German Foreign Office. And I, I now read from this memorandum. On the question of payments to Karmazin, Karmazin receives 30,000 marks for the VDA 
the People's League for Germans abroad until 1 April 1940, and from then on, 15,000 marks monthly. Furthermore, the Central Office for Racial Germans, Volksdeutsche Mittelstelle, has deposited 300,000 marks for Karmassen with the German mission in, in Bratislava, Pressburg, on which he could fall back in an emergency. Furthermore, Karmassen has received money from Reich Minister Seiss Inquart. For the present, it has been impossible to determine what amount, what amounts had been involved and whether the payments still continue. Therefore, it appears that Karmassen has been provided with sufficient money. Thus, one could await whether he would put up new demands himself. I should have read another line herewith presented to the Reich Foreign Minister, signed Vermont. This document shows the complicity of the German Foreign Office in the subsidization, subsidization of illegal organizations abroad. More important, it shows that the Germans still considered it necessary to supply their undercover representatives in Pressburg with substantial funds, even after the declaration of the so-called independent state of Slovakia. Sometime in the winter of 1938-39, defendant Goering conferred with Dukonsky and Mach, two leaders in the Slovak extremist group who were accompanied by Karmasin. The Slovaks told Goering of their desire for what they called independence, with strong political, economic, and military ties to Germany. They promised that the Jewish problem would be solved as it had been solved in Germany, that the Communist Party would be prohibited. The notes of the meeting report that Goering considered that the Slovak efforts towards independence were to be supported, but as the document will show, his motives were scarcely altruistic. I now offer in evidence document 2801 PS, as exhibit USA 109, undated minutes of a conversation between Goering and Dierkonski. This document was captured among the files of the German Foreign Office. I now read these minutes, which are jotted down in somewhat telegraphic style. To begin with, Dierkonski, Deputy Prime Minister, reads out Declaration, contents, friendship for the Führer, gratitude that through the Führer, autonomy has become possible for the Slovaks. The Slovaks never want to belong to Hungary. The Slovaks want full independence with strongest political, economic, and military ties to Germany, Bratislava to be the capital. The execution of the plan only possible if the army and police are Slovak. An independent Slovakia to be proclaimed at the meeting of the first Slovak Diet. In the case of a plebiscite, the majority would favor a separation from Prague. Jews will vote for Hungary. The area of the plebiscite to be up to the march where a large Slovak population lives. The Jewish problem will be solved similarly to that in Germany. The Communist Party will be to be prohibited. 
The Germans in Slovakia do not want to belong to Hungary, but wish to stay in Slovakia. The German influence with the Slovak government considerable. The appointment of a German minister, member of the cabinet, has been promised. At present, negotiations with Hungary are being conducted by the Slovaks. The Czechs are more yielding toward the Hungarians than the Slovaks. The Field Marshal, that's Field Marshal Goering, considers that the Slovak negotiations towards independence are to be supported in a suitable manner. Czechoslovakia without Slovakia is still more at our mercy. Air bases in Slovakia are of great importance for the German Air Force for use against the East. On 12 February, a Slovak delegation journeyed to Berlin. It consisted of Tuka, one of the Slovaks with whom the Germans had been in contact, and Karmassen, the paid representatives of the Nazi conspirators, representative in Slovakia. They conferred with Hitler and the defendant Ribbentrop in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin on Sunday, 12 February, 1939. I now offer in evidence document 2790 PS as exhibit USA 110, the captured German Foreign Office minutes of that meeting. After a brief, brief welcome, Tuka thanks the Führer for granting this meeting. He addresses the Führer with my Führer, and he voices the opinion that he, though only a modest man himself, might well claim to speak for the Slovak nation. The Czech courts and prison give him the right to make such a statement. He states that the Führer had not only opened the Slovak question, but that he had been also the first one to acknowledge the dignity of the Slovak nation. The Slovakian people will gladly fight under the leadership of the Führer for the maintenance of European civilization. Obviously, future association with the Czechs had become an impossibility for the Slovaks from a moral as well as an economic point of view. And then skipping to the last sentence, I entrust the fate of my people to your care, addressing that to the Fuhrer. During the meeting, the Nazi conspirators apparently were successful in planting the idea of insurrection with the Slovak delegation. I refer to the final sentence of the document, which I have just read, a sentence spoken by Tuka. I entrust the fate of my people to your care. It is apparent from these documents that in mid-February 1939, the Nazis had a well-disciplined well -disciplined group of Slovaks at their service, many of them drawn from the ranks of Father Hlinka's Lin party. Flattered by the personal attention of such men as Hitler and defendant Ribbentrop, and subsidized by German representatives, these Slovaks proved willing tools in the hands of the Nazi conspirators. <coughs> in addition to the Slovaks, the conspirators made use of the few Germans still remaining within the mutilated Czech Republic. Kunt, Henlein's deputy, who had been appointed leader of this German minority, 
created as many artificial, I quote, focal points of German culture, end the quote, as possible. Germans from the districts handed over to Germany were ordered from Berlin to continue their studies at the German University in Prague and to make it a center of aggressive Nazism with the assistance of German civil servants, a deliberate campaign of Nazi infiltration into Czech public and private institutions was carried out. And the Henleinists gave full cooperation with Gestapo agents from the Reich who appeared on Czech soil. The Nazi political activity was designed to undermine and to weaken Czech resistance to the commands from Germany. In the face of continued threats and duress on both diplomatic and propaganda levels, the Czech government was unable to take adequate measures against these trespasses upon its sovereignty. I'm using as the basis of my remarks the Czechoslovak government official report, number 998 PS. In early March, with the date for the final march into Czechoslovakia already close at hand, fifth column activity moved into its final phase. In Bohemia and Moravia, the FS, Henlein's equivalent of the SS, were in touch with the Nazi conspirators in the Reich and laid the groundwork for the events of 14 and 15 March. I now offer an evidence, document 2826 PS, as Exhibit USA 111. This is an article by, by SS group leader Carl Hermann Frank, published in the publication Berman und Meren, Bohemia and Moravia, the official pe periodical of the Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia. Edition, March 1941, page 79. This is an article written by one of the Nazi leaders in Czechoslovakia at the moment of Germany's greatest military successes. It is a boastful article and reveals with a frankness, frankness rarely found in the Nazi press both the functions which the FS and the SS served and the pride the Nazi conspirators took in the activities of these organizations. Perhaps That's a fairly easy. long quotation. Yes. Are you um, going on with this tomorrow, Mr. Oldman? Yes. Will, will, you, will you take the whole day, do you think? Oh, no, it? sir. Not so long. I should think uh, not more than an hour and a half. And then after that, will the British uh, yes. prosecutors go on? Yes. Thank you.